Hello, my name is uh, John Hearn. I'm a professor of economics, banking and finance. And for my undergraduates, I give a one semester introductory course to the subject uh, based upon the fact that they may not have done any economics before. Uh, there is a book that I have written with 10 chapters in it and I give 10 lectures which go with each of those chapters picking out something that's particularly interesting uh, in uh, that section. So I shall introduce these lectures to you over a series of uh, videos. The first lecture comes from chapter one, the econ which is economics and the economic problem, and it's called the blurred interface between politics and economics. Uh, you can study economics without studying politics. Uh, they are separate things, but of course in uh, modern society it's very difficult sometimes to see the difference between uh, the two subjects at the edge. So I hopefully will sort out uh, some of these uh, issues as we go through this particular lecture. Now. Before we start, let's just take two definitions so that you're quite clear on what I'm talking about. Economics, uh, uh, Lionel Robbins, uh, uh, a professor at uh, London School of Economics, said this a long time ago. Economics is the science which studies human behaviour as the relationship between ends and scarce means which have alternative use. So if you really want to impress people uh, and uh, they ask you what you're studying, you say economics and economics is and you can use it more simply than that. You're just trying to study the way that resources are allocated to products in a world where there aren't enough resources to go round for to everyone. Politics, well I just take politics to be the art of government. Um, uh, so uh, uh, it uh, does require a government and then of course it requires a government with uh, an ideology. Uh, which again we'll talk about as we go through this. Now there are a couple of uh, further introductory points that we need to get clear in our minds before this lecture really starts and that is uh, in the economy there are two di distinct groups of goods. There are free goods and economic goods. Now free goods, there's enough of them around uh, for us to all be able to consume as much as we want without requiring any allocative mechanism. So that's things like air, seawater, um, solar energy, uh, all of these things we can consume and we pay no price for them. There's no way that these need to be allocated or require allocative mechanisms. However, if you took air, then fresh air uh, is not uh, as uh, readily available as air, so you might have to pay for air under certain circumstances, particularly, say, if you're underwater. Uh, so the free good is not really what we study in economics. What we study is the economic goods. And the economic goods are all of those products which are scarce. Now, scarce means that there's not enough of them to go around without requiring an allocative mechanism. Which means that in the process of trying to allocate resources, choices have to be made. Now, at this point, we're going to go back a little bit in terms of history and prehistory to try and develop an idea in your mind that will help you sort of think through to the modern day and separate at the start politics from economics and then we'll bring the two together towards the end. So this is a sort of in the beginning but it wasn't really in the beginning but in the beginning let's assume there were caves around and there were families, uh, a man, a woman and a child or children who lived in those caves and they subsisted. So this was a subsistence economy where you had to get all your own food, make all your own clothes, protect yourself uh, because there was no trade with anyone else. This was just you uh, looking after yourself. There wouldn't be a government, so there'd be no politics. Uh, and it would be, I suppose, like the very beginning of um, 
uh, a capitalist society where, which are often described as uh, every person for themselves, survival of the fittest, those sort of characteristics. So in the beginning we've got that. Now let's whiz forward, so we're only a couple of million years ago. Now as this develops you'll find that the caves are producing surpluses and it may well be that uh, the cave next door to me uh, is a person who's particularly good at making spears uh, and I am particularly good at hunting uh, so we might set up a sort of bilateral trade where next door neighbour stays at home and makes spears and I uh, go out hunting and we trade. It's a bilateral form of trade and it's barter so we exchange uh, goods for goods and that process of specialisation of function increases the amount that is produced, can increase the amount of surpluses that are produced and, uh, and foster more trade. Now in this situation there would be extended groups of people rather than just uh, uh, small family groups and that requires some organisation, it requires some leadership, it may only be leadership by age uh, and it requires some rules uh, which uh, may be uh, generally accepted rules, nothing written down, but people know how they should behave within the context of an extended group of people. Now if we bring ourselves more up to date, go back a few thousand years perhaps, you'll find that these extended groups have grown into what we might like to call countries. And in countries there, are, there is multilateral trade trading between lots of different people and because these people probably don't know each other you have a totally different condition from that which existed previously. Now here this system will only work with a monetary system to back it up. It won't work under a barter system. So you need something, a generally accepted item which people know that they can hold on to and always get rid of because everyone wants it and as long as it can be used as a medium of exchange, a unit of account, a store of value, a standard of deferred payment, the characteristics of uh, basic characteristics of money, uh, then you will be able to develop this system. And this again would be a sort of market-based capitalist system. This would have limited government. There would be someone at the centre of this trying to organise things and plan things and prepare things. So we've now got to a position where economics and politics are, uh, to a certain extent, coming together. Now at this point, uh, let me explain to you what is meant by capitalism. Uh, and it is just any political system that supports and reinforces private property rights. That's all capital capitalism is. It's something which accepts, supports uh, private property rights. And all the characteristics you may associate with capitalism can flow from these private property rights. You know, this is my cave. The one next door is your cave. Uh, and in my cave, I do what I like. In your cave, you do what uh, you like. Um, that's the early form of a private property right. So take that forward to uh, the modern day and people with private property uh, can find it grows uh, and they may want to use it to allocate resources to producing other things. They may be motivated by uh, profits. They may understand a price mechanism. And these characteristics of capitalism all flow from private property rights. Take private property rights away and you get, as we'll see in a moment, a totally different system. We've talked about capitalism and uh, at this stage I quite like to make the distinction between uh, a sort of free market capitalism which has rules and regulations to promote fairness and competition in, uh, in the form of a, a level playing field between uh, uh, players and crony capitalism, which is a sort of corrupted form of capitalism that ignores that rule uh, and 
doesn't give everyone equal access but creates privileges for some groups at the expense of other groups. And obviously if you go back in history uh, you'll expect that the sort of big, strong, violent, aggressive type of person uh, would be able to take advantage of the people or persons without those characteristics. So it's a, a form of corrupted capitalism and take it right forward to uh, the present day and you'll have powerful individuals, powerful firms, monopolies, monopoly governments, all of whom uh, you can observe tend to create privileges for some groups of people at the expense of others. So ideally our target would be to have free market capitalism, to remove all of these privileges and just promote fairness through competition. Now, as we go through the last couple of centuries, so uh, governments, people observe that uncontrolled capitalism does cause these sorts of problems. And there are two ways of dealing with this, if you like. Uh, uh, one solution is just to get rid of capitalism, to say let's replace capitalism with something else. The other solution is to say let's work with capitalism, let's see if we can make it better, fairer and uh, create uh, the rules and regulations which will make it function more efficiently. And again at this point there's a lot of involvement of government and politics in this situation. One of the solutions if you want to overthrow capitalism, get rid of capitalism, um, is to set up a communist state where you no longer have private property rights, you have common property rights. Now this has happened, so it's something that one can look into. Um, the Russian Revolution, 1917, um, China uh, revolutions uh, uh, also overthrew the autocracies, got rid of the, the capitalist system as such, set up communist parties, single states, which were command economies to allocate resources and they removed private property rights and created common property rights. What they did in fact was create equality in one sense at a stroke overnight and it's what I quite like to call the wealth and income trick. Wealth by definition is what you own. So your wealth would grow as you grow older because you'll own, collect more things. Income is what you receive from uh, selling your labour uh, or your capital and it's a flow, a stream that comes in uh, to your household every week, every month, every year. And it's your income that allows you to determine your standard of living, what you can buy in terms of resources. Your wealth, however, uh, is uh, not linked to your standard of living in the same way. It's just a measure of what you own. And what the communist revolutions did by removing private property rights was say, OK, we now are all equal owners of the wealth of this country. So at a stroke, you've created an equality. It's not the important equality in terms of standard of living, but politically you've started down the route of what you want to do, which is uh, make everyone equal. So we need to be careful of this. And if we look at the alternative of trying to say, let's get the free market sector, let's get capitalism under control, then you're really looking at a process which is evolution rather than revolution. You can't do this one overnight. Uh, uh, and uh, what you will see is that as democracies grow, so there are attempts to try and harness capitalism, harness the free market, make it uh, a better and a fairer system for producing goods and services. Now markets do seem to allocate most resources more efficiently than any other system. 
There are, however, among the economic goods, several goods which can't be produced in marketplaces. If you think of two extremes, there's a private good. Now, a private good has two characteristics which are called rival and excludable characteristics. Now, the rival characteristic means that if I produce something for you, I can provide it for you and nobody else. The excludable characteristic means that if you consume something, you can stop other people consuming it, you can exclude them from consuming it, and probably 90% of the products that you consume uh, are private goods, and they will work fairly well with a marketplace. You don't really need anyone to take over or interfere with that marketplace, although rules and regulations are important. At the other extreme, you've got something which is called a public good. And the public good doesn't have these two characteristics of rival and excludable. In fact, the very opposite. They have non-rival and non-excludable characteristics. And here, the marketplace doesn't work. These public goods are things like law and order, external defence, and then the classic uh, economics textbook will tell you street lighting. We all like streets to be well lit. We are much safer if streets are well lit. But none of us will buy street lighting because we can't exclude other people from its use. We're quite happy to put a light outside our door so we can unlock the door and use a key. Um, but that's because it's on private property. Out in the streets, no one will provide uh, uh, street lighting. And so it's what's called a collective consumption good. We all want it, but no one's prepared to buy it. And that's the one good reason for saying we need a third party, a government or a local government, to take money away from us in tax and buy this particular good, the good we want, the public good. So you can see there's a role here for government. You've got to have government involved in buying the public good. Now, there are two other types of good, which are both private goods, but they're private goods which have external benefits for society or external costs to society. And it's arguably the case that government should perhaps consider these for uh, investigation, support uh, and uh, um, policy decisions. Merit goods are things like education and health. They have benefits for the private individual, but they also have benefits to society. And the argument is if private individuals had to pay at the market price for their education, they would under-consume it. And society would be better off if more education was consumed. The same for health. A healthy, educated workforce is much better for economic growth, for the economy, for society as a whole. So you might want government to support in some way your education system, your health system, these merit goods to make sure that more of them are consumed. At the other side of this, there are things called demerit goods. Now, as you can imagine, these are things that are over consumed in society. So these are things like tobacco, alcohol, gambling. Uh, these things, if you so the market price against them would be over-consumed to the detriment of society. So the argument here is that it might be useful if a third party was involved in um, reducing the consumption of demerit goods. And I suppose a sort of simple illustration of what government could do here is to put a tax on demerit goods, which will reduce consumption of those, and transfer that to subsidised merit goods, which would increase the consumption of those. Not Quite as simple as that, but you can see, again, there's a role for government and there's a role for politics here to uh, allocate resources. So we're in a situation where uh, now what I'm saying is that probably the majority of products can be dealt with through marketplaces, but there are some products, public goods, that have to be managed by government 
and others merit goods and which need to be supported by government and demerit goods that need to be controlled in other ways by government. Now going back to this sort of comparison then between let's have a command economy which replaces the capitalist system or let's have a capitalist economy, uh, there was a very interesting uh, comparison done in the 1970s and here I have a confession. I cannot find the original reference for this uh, so I'll obviously ask you to trust me I'm an economist uh, but if anyone can find the original reference for this I would much appreciate that because I, I just can't find it but what it did is looked at four countries and it tried to compare the living standards of the top 10% of people in those countries with the bottom 10% of people in those countries and what it concluded was that there were four ratios which were very different. In one of those countries, the top 10% were 22 times better off than the bottom 10%. In the second country, they were 16 times better off. In the third country, they were four times better off. And in the last country, they were two and a half times better off. Now, the four countries that were looked at were China, Russia, the UK and the USA. Now remember, China and Russia had had their revolutions. They'd already moved towards a situation of trying to create a fairer, more equal society. And they created equality overnight in terms of the ownership of wealth, but the standards of living remained very unequal. And in fact, it was China where the ratio was 22 to 1. The top 10% were 22 times better off than the bottom 10%. Russia, it was 16 to 1, the UK, it was 4 to 1, and the US was 2.5 to 1. Now that's interesting, of course, because capitalism was never set up to create equality, but it does it. Because people are free to move from place to place, from job to job, to be inspired, to look to uh, identify market niches to grow their own standard of living over time things tended to equalize whereas those countries which uh, solved their problem at a stroke we're all equal owners of everything didn't then distribute their resources in a fairer way uh, they tended to replace one uh, elite by another elite and that's probably a simple reason why countries uh, like China and Russia um, stopped being communist uh, command economies because uh, it didn't work. And in fact, both of those countries, China and Russia, became capitalist. This was in the 1990s. I travelled to both countries at the time and was uh, um, interested uh, in what was happening and still am very interested in what is happening because they both became capitalist which means they both accepted and promoted private property rights. You could now become a millionaire, a billionaire, you could own things, uh, you could exclude other people from their ownership, uh, you would be able to pay for things which would, could, could enrich you and no one else. You had all the characteristics of a capitalist system because you went into uh, reintroducing the fact that people would own their own things private property rights. Now at that time Russia became democratic, China didn't. China remained a political system which was uh, still communist, a single party state. So there was no democracy, there was capitalism, but no democracy. Russia, there was capitalism and democracy. Uh, and it's been interesting looking at which countries have grown the quickest. Uh, Russia has grown more slowly than China. Uh, I'm not advocating uh, a single uh, party state, but the one advantage that it does have is it can make decisions very quickly. Uh, when I was in, I went to China just before they flooded the three gorges and, uh, the three gorges and uh, displaced uh, millions of people. It would be very difficult to do that in a democracy because there'd be so many committees, so many decisions made, so many 
concerns about wildlife that might be uh, affected by this decision that it will probably take uh, years, decades uh, to actually carry out this policy, whereas uh, under the single state in China it was all solved within uh, um, uh, a couple of years, all done. So uh, it's an interesting point that one can associate with economic growth and we'll look at that in another area. But uh, ob observing what was happening in these two countries was very interesting. Now in Europe, including the UK and the USA, the other thing I've noticed is that you, it's very difficult to stop this sort of government creep. They seem to be getting more and more involved in the capitalist economy, which means that there is less and less capitalism that's free to do the job that it used to do. Uh, it's interesting whether it's reversible or not. Uh, have we gone so far we're never going to be able to get back? This century, the global financial crisis, 2008, the pandemic now, have seen more and more government involvement. And it is, in one sense, worrying that this could lead, if you like, to almost the um, same thing as communism did but over a much longer period of time it will remove capitalism uh, from economics and put governments totally in control of all resource allocations. Let's hope not, but we wait and see how that develops. So we're now in a situation where hopefully you understand what the economic problem is. The economic problem is just that there's not enough to go around without an allocative mechanism. It's not economic problems like unemployment or inflation or lack of economic growth. They are all symptoms of the economic problem, which is just that there is not enough to go around. And as economists, that's what interests us, that there's not enough to go around. So our concern is uh, what's the best way to allocate resources? Is it a command type economy? Is it a, a free market capitalist economy? And uh, what role has government in this? Now, I don't think there's any economists who don't see a role for government. Um, but when we're looking at this, we need to try and understand degrees of government intervention. Do we need more intervention? Do we need less intervention? Have we got too much? Have we got too little? Have we got the wrong sort of invent intervention? And so on. So the first thing you're deciding when you look at economics is how much should government and politics be involved in the economy. Now there's one measure within all of the things that you look at that you must uh, consider very carefully and it's called opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is very important because it always measures real things. It's not a nominal measure, it's not a measure in terms of money, it's a measure in terms of the alternative that you forego when you do something. For example, if I consume one product and use some of my resources in the form of money to buy one product, what have I foregone? What can I not now buy with that money? That's the cost to me of buying one thing is what I can't buy. If I'm a producer and I allocate resources to producing this, I can't then produce that. What again is the measure of what I can't produce? So with opportunity cost, you're always measuring the foregone alternative, the thing that you can't buy, can't produce, if you buy these resources or use resources in that way. And it removes the problem of measuring things in a nominal sense, just in terms of numbers, uh, because there's quite a lot of confusion when you measure things in a nominal sense. For example, I could just create some inflation of 10% and say we're now 10% richer, because the nominal number says we're 10% richer. But of course we aren't, because the real number tells us probably that there's uh, no change uh, as a result of doing this. Now the final point I just want to get clear in your mind because as these lectures uh, unfold and I will deal with these lectures as um, an economist who provides you with all of the necessary 
arguments for both sides, if there are two sides, but uh, I lean on one particular side and so we, you need to be aware of the fact that out there there are what you would call more interventionist economists and less intervention economists. So more intervention economists believe that the government uh, needs to get involved in doing more things if we want to allocate resources efficiently and fairly, and other economists who think that uh, we need uh, uh, less uh, rather than more. So here um, I have to tell you where I stand and I'll tell you where uh, other groups of economists stand. So if you look at people like Keynesian economists, the latest uh, uh, group to become uh, interesting to politicians, the modern monetary theorists, Minskyites, uh, uh, they are all interventionist economists. They all want to do more, particularly in terms of macroeconomics. They want to manage and manipulate aggregate monetary demand because they think that is significant in terms of employment and uh, economic growth. At the other extreme, uh, uh, there are the less interventionist economists, and I have to say that I am one of those. And the less interventionist economists, you might describe them in terms of being monetarists, Austrian economists, free marketeers, they're the ones who believe uh, that the economy will grow quicker, there will be greater moves to equality, living standards will rise much more quickly if you release the economy and let it work without interference, without uh, um, too much governance, other than of course those rules and regulations which create fairness. Now again it's a rough rule of thumb but uh, to, to my view if the government was doing the things that I said they've got to do, which is provide the public good and support the merit good, then I'd have them spending about, and less than, 25% of our national income, our real national income. At the moment, they're probably spending um, between 35 and 45% of uh, our national income on uh, intervening in the economy. Now that's necessary if you're pursuing interventionist policies, if you're thinking that you can manipulate the demand, if you think that you can budget uh, an economy into deficits which will create more growth, employ more people and grow the economy. I don't happen to think that that is right and when you yourself are looking at this you need to make this comparison uh, you need to understand that there are different groupings of economists out there and think carefully about what side, what both sides say and don't sort of eliminate uh, at one side without thinking through both sides and coming to some decision. So I hope this has been uh, just a, a brief introduction for you. And I will try and follow this up then with other lectures uh, which firstly introduce microeconomics to you and then get on to the really interesting area where the big arguments are in terms of macroeconomics. But the good thing is that throughout the course there are lots of uh, points which are interesting, argumentative and uh, hopefully you'll go away uh, with a much more critical mind and think, yeah, I need to... Um, argue with people about this, I need to debate these things uh, uh, with people because that's the only way we'll get a clearer understanding of the way forward and the way that we can benefit society um, through our uh, uh, intellectual understanding of how it works. So I look forward to speaking to you again when lecture number two comes along. Thank you.